flesh to understand what's going on, what's at stake in France right now. So what's going on right now is a godsend. We've got to let the Republic go to the end of its logic. What the suburbs are doing right now, of course the motive is bullshit. They don't ransack when one of their own kill our children or shut up a Bataclan, but that's just the way it is. But you have to be strategic, and I remind you that we're Europeans. Right now they're doing the job for us, it's perfect. They're way more effective than any political video. I made a little video to try to show how rotten was the Republic. Okay, so compared to a perspective of, you know, we must go out into the streets and confront armed rioters and hold up signs saying stealing is violating God's Ten, ten Commandments, and I think that's even a worse strategy. So between having an exaggerated sense of your own importance so that you go out into the streets confronting, you know, rioters and looters, all right, that's, that's absolutely terrible. So your first responsibility should be to your family and then to your extended family and your, your community. But uh, people want to fall down on you know, either side of an extreme. Right? One, one extreme is to think that they can just completely you know, change the, the nature of reality, that they can go out there and they can change the world, they can band together with their friends. Like Dennis Prager says, you know, he, he wants to shape the future of America. He, he feels like he can, he can save the Bible and uh, keep it alive for future generations. All right, this is an absurd level of overconfidence about how much influence you can have. On the other hand, you should pray for the welfare of the government. It's a basic Jewish teaching that I, I subscribe to from Perke Avot, the Ethics of the Fathers, from uh, the Mishnah 2,000 years ago. Rabbi Hanina teaches, pray for the welfare of the government, for were it not for the fear it inspires, every man would swallow his neighbor alive. Right. This is a rabbi teaching when Jews and Romans are constantly at each other's throats, they go through two very intense wars that mark the end of the rise of the Roman Empire, and uh, well over a million Jews die in these wars. So this is not someone speaking out of a, a naive, naive understanding of reality and a naive understanding of the uh, cruelty and the downsides of uh, Roman rule. But you want even bad government almost always bad government is preferable to anarchy. Pray for the welfare of the government, for were it not for the fear it inspires, every man would swallow his neighbor alive. Or as political philosopher Thomas Hobbes put it in the 17th century, life without government would be nasty, brutish, and short. So to say that you're happy to see the government burn down is essentially to side off on the, the mass slaughter of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and millions of your fellow citizens fellow members of your nation. They're doing a thousand times better. They're humiliating it, even internationally. We're one year away from the Olympic Games, and here's what France is, what everyone sees on TV. So let it... Yes, a multicultural, anti-white, rainbow flag-waving government is preferable to no government. Be After a while, they'll call people like us, like us, to come and clean up. For now, just sit tight. Yeah. This guy's delusional, thinking that uh, the elites are going to cause call people like him, Papacito and Jean-Francois, to come and clean up the mess. Right? Uh, people like Richard Spencer and other distant right leaders believe that uh, eventually the government's going to turn to them to clean up the mess. This police force that helped this regime so much during the COVID is now sent by the same regime to contain the Huns. With contempt to boot since Emmanuel Macron, condemn the policeman who did his job. And the police don't want to strike. They can't. Uh, the French overall have a pretty high quality of life. Right? Uh, the French overall are pretty happy and feel awesome about being French. France definitely has its problems. But uh, overall, life in France is not a hellscape. For reasons of status, money, so they won't strike. So the Republic is faced with a dilemma. It has its arms and its police. And the chat says, I'll call on the Saps who watch football and endure regime punishment beatings. No, they'll call on the police and, if necessary, the armed forces, who are plenty capable of, I would expect, to you know, get, get a rein on this eventually. So our, our ruling elites are not idiots, and they do not completely lack aptitude and competence. They're not going to call on Papacito and Jean-Francois Garapie and Richard Spencer to clean this up. 
they will turn this over to trained professionals in the police and possibly in the armed forces. Men who are in the process of fighting each other. The Huns shouldn't go too far and the cops shouldn't break. But in the current logic, the Huns and further and the policemen are likely to crack. So your first instinct is to defend your country, but you won't defend it. You'll defend a regime and you'll allow the far left to say, oh, look, there's this political. OK, Luke's making some uh, good challenges here. We must support a government that promotes chaos and anarchy to support to stop chaos and anarchy. A, a, we should recognize that having police is better than not having police. Right? Even if the police are celebrating things that you don't agree with, and even if the government you know, celebrates some things that you, you know, think are, are terrible, right? It, where, where on earth do you think it's better? Right? You live in the United Kingdom. So where on earth do you think it's better than what's going on in the United Kingdom, France, uh, Germany, the United States, Canada? Like, where are these you know, much more blessed, much more free, much more prosperous societies? I, I can't think of any. So whatever problems that France has and Canada has and the United States and the United Kingdom have, you still have life better than 99.9% .9 of people who have ever lived, and you still have life better than 98% you know, of people who are alive today. And so I would think that should inculcate some sense of gratitude that for all the flaws of the government and the elites, and you know, I probably agree with most of your, your critiques of them, they still provide you a quality of life that's better than 98% of people elsewhere in the world. Oh, Singapore and Japan. Well, move there. Uh, move there. Right? Life in Singapore is, uh, is no walk in the park. Right? It's a pretty tough place to adjust to. Uh, Japan. Japan has no interest in you moving there. So, you know, wh where else on earth are they going to take you in and be happy about uh, you, you moving there? The quality of life is declining. Okay, compared to where? Where do you think the quality of life is so much better? Do you, do you really think the quality of life is just dramatically better in Singapore and, and Japan? I, I know people who live in Singapore, and I know people who live in Japan, and there are plenty of ways that life in Singapore and Japan is better. Just like I was in Australia, and there's virtually no crime. There's, compared to the United States, high social trust and so, high social cohesion. So those are some ways that uh, life in Australia is much better than in the United States. On the other hand, if I moved to Australia, right, I would earn about 60% as much money and my living expenses would be twice as much as they are in America, right? Uh, 67 American cents gets you one Australian dollar, right? Australia, United Kingdom, France, Germany, Europe are in for very tough times economically, right? Life in America is far more prosperous, far more free, and uh, is on a far better trajectory, right? The United States is going to continue to dominate the world, even outstrip its competitors in the decades ahead. ...ethnical group fighting this ethnic group, and that's not at all desirable, because they'll once again be the referee. Now that's over. Now they have to be involved. Did you saw what happened to Martin's Bilongo? He tried to meet the rioters, thinking that all of Edify's submissiveness was going to pay off, and he got beat up with a crutch. So, yeah, I live in West L.A. There's virtually no crime here, right? Virtually no crime in West L.A., no, virtually no crime in Beverly Hills. There's virtually no cr crime in the eastern suburbs of Sydney. No, it's a, it's a very competitive life. You have to work really hard, and you have to essentially earn six figures to be able to live in nice areas. That's what's going to happen to the far left in the next few days. They're going to be beaten with crutches. You'll note that I profess... And the chat says you need to visit the United Kingdom again. 40 is turning into a pit. Yeah, a lot of problems in the United Kingdom, but still life is better, I would expect, than 98% of uh, places on Earth. Yes, that people in the countryside would be safe from such things, and they are. It's all happening in the cities. I warned you a long time ago, go to the country. Normally, people our age in the country are conservative. They know why they left the cities. So it's all very well for... I don't know about you, but I love to live my life around writers and professors and philosophers. And uh, these people overwhelmingly live in cities. I also want to live my life around Orthodox Jews. But, uh, where, where can you go where you can go to you know, social gatherings of writers you know, pretty much every night of the week? Right? You can only do that in a, a big city. Right? There are all sorts of 
you know, opportunities in a city that are simply not available for people in the country, right? Yeah, go to the country if you like it, but uh, most people who enjoy life in the city are not going to be thrilled with life in the country. For the countryside to be spared, if you live in the country, you won't have riots. And if a rioter shows up, you've got all the tools you need, not so much in the city. Right now, they're tearing down apartments of centrist and far leftist. These people look out their windows and see fire with Huns dancing around. Absolutely beautiful statement by Papacito. I didn't even know this guy, apparently. Yeah, for Jean-Francois, this is beautiful because Jean-Francois, like Papacito, also wants to stay on the sidelines, you know, stay in a remote area and just watch everything burn down. And if you love people and have people who love you, you're not going to be at ease with your society going up in flames. Right? A very different perspective than that of Steve Saylor or Charles Murray, who are still highly invested in America. He's a far right guy. I should know, but I didn't know this guy. Uh, but my God, is that what I think? We are faced with uh, a situation in which we have absolutely no interest at intervening one side or the other. It is wait, wait, wait. Who's asking you to intervene? Right, there's no, I agree. There's no need for ordinary people to intervene. You should take care of your family. You should do your job. You should take care of your community. You should take care of your extended family. You should develop skills and pursue your interests. And you should uh, volunteer and help out you know, people, you know, do, do charity work, help people out 5, 10, 15 hours a week. I think almost everyone should make, make a few hours a week at least to help other people out. No one's calling on randos on you know, far-right Twitter and you know, the right-wing sections of YouTube and social media to save a burning society. Hey, this is pure delusion. Right, this idea of, oh, we should force ourselves to stand back. Now it's asking you to intervene in what are criminal matters. These are policing matters. Right? These are matters for the police. And our leaders, our elites, our politicians, even on the left, right, they're not going to be content with their entire society burning down. They will use police and increase police presence and bring in armed forces if necessary to get a handle on these things. Nobody's asking for right-wing randos to intervene here. Is the conclusion of what we've been saying would happen. It's happening, so we're right, and there is distraction there. Please, guys, look forward, viewers. I need you to stand back and stand by. There is distraction of the very regime that ultimately is not persecuting those minorities. In fact, it is bolstering. As if the police stop the causes. That's not the job. It's not the police job to address causes. We don't know the causes of crime. Right, but we do know what stops crime, and that's to put dangerous criminals in prison for a very long time. Right, if we simply lock up the super predators for a long time, we will crush crime. We get to choose how much crime we have. Right, we could live in the United States in a society that is ten times safer than it is right now by simply locking up super predators. In the United Kingdom, you could live in a society that is ten times far safer than it is right now. If if you mustered the political and cultural will to lock up super predators for longer periods. You would crush crime. Very simple. And Republicans, for all their flaws, they all pretty much seem to be on board with tougher law enforcement and policing and punishment of violent criminals than parties on the left. It is emboldening those minorities. It is giving them chances that they wouldn't have had otherwise. This regime is really oppressing us, white European heterosexual as if the police stop uh, grooming gangs. Well, why are so many women vulnerable to grooming gangs? Because they don't have much of a life in their families, right? If these women had any sort of connection to their families, they, they wouldn't be picked up by grooming gangs. And if men protected their families, they would not permit the thriving of grooming gangs, right? Citizens taking action legally, forming safety patrols could put a stop to grooming gangs. And politically taking action, stopping immigration and insisting on higher punishment for violent criminals would uh, put a major dent in this bad behavior. People, but let, let this regime be totally destroyed or partially at least weakened by whatever amount of force these rioters are capable of deploying. Right, so JF has uh, some interesting thoughts on the French race so, riots. I mean, it's possible. if. If the fireworks are meant to create that kind of sound and that kind of look, uh, fascinating. <laughs>
<laughs> I don't know. It's good to know. Thank you for letting uh, me know. Super Channel says, take my magic beans. Do you think Ukrainian women will be an option due to the war? The longer it goes on, the more women available. I think that there will be very few... Um, I think they will definitely be adding to the market. And when you add to the market, you know, more offer, uh, that leaves space for lower price. And I'm not saying just trust the place. I'm saying just trust reality. And the reality is that you can't stop rampaging violent criminals as a civilian, right? So what alternative do you have? So trust reality, avoid violent criminals the best you can to the extent that it's legal, uh, join safety patrols in your community like uh, take up arms if it's legal, get trained in self-protection, in communal protection, uh, look after your families, you know, earn as much money as you can legally and morally and in an upstanding fashion and develop better and better relations with the people around you. That's the best way to stay safe in turbulent times and in good times. And therefore, you may acquire a Ukrainian woman or a woman that got her mail taken by a U Ukrainian woman. Uh, so whenever this kind of event happens, uh, it disbalance in the sexes, it's good. It's good for the other sex when there are more members of the, their opposite sex. That being said, uh, there is the possibility that they will be, they come from a very corrupt, very low level, high criminality country. Safety patrol sounds like a lawsuit in the making or career ending viral social media video. No, do it right. There, there are all sorts of uh, safety patrols all, all around the United States. Do it legally, do it correctly, do it in in connection with law enforcement, you've got the, the guardian angels in New York City. Uh, Jewish communities have uh, their own, their own uh, safety patrols, and they take you know, many steps to try to keep their community safe. You should take legal steps to keep your community, your street safe. And that might mean you will be dealing with a, a female who has pre-evolved to fuck you up in ways that you, don't, you can't even conceive of as a way. So I, I think this notion that uh, Ukrainian women are just evolved to F you up, you know, far more likely, it, you know, just disproportionately compared to American women, I, I think that's delusional here by, by JF. Yeah, there will be some culture clash with uh, Eastern European women compared to Western European women. I just don't think it's at all clear that Eastern European women are just you know, so much more dangerous. Western European. So you have to be careful for this. Uh... Ukrainian values are not the same as Western European values. And, uh, you know, there was this... Uh, East yeah, you have to be careful with who you allow into your life. You have to be careful with whom you go to bed. You have to be careful with whom you choose to have children, right? You should be very careful about the people you allow into your life, whether they are Ukrainian, Eastern European or not. Western European girl with a fat guy on TV. And, and it, was the, it was clear to anyone of the audience that she was with him. What if a gentleman of color gets up in your grill demanding that you kiss his boot? You should look at your alternatives. In some alternatives, the best thing for you to do would be to kick him in the balls, punch him in the face, and beat him down. Uh, in other situations, depending on who you are, what the situation is, the best thing would be to, to do would be to uh, kiss his boot. Right? There's a time and a place to fight, and there's a time and a place to acquiesce, and there's a time and a place to run, and there's a time and a place to call police. But uh, the better connected you are to other people, right, the more you will find out what's going on in the world around you, and the more likely other people will be to come to your aid, just as the more likely you will be to come to other people's aid. So the answer to this problem, along with every other problem, from earthquakes to how do you survive inflation, unemployment, uh, technological disruption... Get connected to your family, your extended family, build friends, build community, be a valuable part of your church, your, your synagogue, volunteer, right? Get rooted, get connected. Him for the green card. And at some point, she basically says it to him. You should never walk alone, right? You, you shouldn't walk alone. You should walk with other people. You should form common cause with other people. You should get bonded with other people. You should create shared reality with other people. And... You should uh, protect other people, and the more that you protect and look out for other people, if uh, they're at all decent, the more likely they are to look out and protect you. <laughs> he starts crying. Uh, you have to be careful. They, they may be, uh, yes, DK Shadow, they are born. Yeah, so Luke makes fun of me here, Luke Croft. Lick the boot, give him your car keys and atone for your whiteness. Sometimes that is a better outcome than getting murdered, right? You think you should stand and deliver and uh, risk, you know, getting murdered. 
right? I, I think it's best to stay alive. And sometimes staying alive means, you know, accepting very humiliating terms. So between accepting humiliation and getting murdered, I say accept some humiliation. Also, you know, get connected with reality and the people around you so that you don't place yourself in situations where these sorts of things happen. Sleeper agents. They, will, they can wreck your life. They will wreck your life. They will wreck your heart. And they will use you to whatever end they want. But sometimes among that use, sometimes a, a window of opportunity opens. Okay, so what type of woman comes along and just uses you and wrecks your life? A woman who's on about the same level of emotional maturity as you, right? We cannot stand to spend much time with people who are either who are less mature than ourselves, right? It's it's just too irritating, infuriating, disgusting, repellent. Like they're they're underachieving, their their maladaptive behavior stinks in our nostrils, and we want to get away. So whoever we bring into our lives is a reflection of us. So JF wants to point the finger at, oh, it's women. They're the cause of so much misery. It's these Ukrainian women, these Eastern European women. They'll, they'll F you up. Well, if you allow you know, bad women into your life, that says a great deal about you. There's something about you that is unhealthy, uh, doesn't have a proper sense of boundaries, d doesn't have self-respect, and therefore doesn't treat other people respectfully, and therefore you're you know, wide open to people coming along and abusing you. All right, let me play a little more here. It's for baby JF. making. Uh, but yeah, males are dying in Ukraine because they've been selected by force to stay there and defend. And the women have been immigrating or staying in Ukraine. So the, the overall mathematical aspect is relatively positive for, for the males outside of this group. Callum Marksworth says, did you see the video of... And Luke Croft mocks me, give up all your honor to live for another day. Yeah, uh, Luke Croft, is there anyone who loves you? What do the people who love you want you to do? Do they want you to take a courageous stand and get murdered? I, I believe you're in your 20s, right? Do, do the people who love you want you to risk your life in some pointless, you know, courageous stand? Or do they want you to stay alive so that they can continue to, you know, have you around and to love you and to build things together with you? If you have people who love you, I suspect you should ask them what they would want you to do. Do they want you to take a pointless, courageous stand that uh, ends your life in your 20s, or would they prefer to see you stay alive for six years and make uh, contributions to their lives, to the community, to the world? Of the rioters cutting down a CCTV pole and the hits. It is something that you'll hear even in high class context with, uh, with rich French people, with highly cultured or educated, okay, this is very good. undertone me... to political conversation. No, maybe yes, a building. <laughs> This is a really good bit here from JF coming up. Uh, Waterweight says, sends five bucks. Thank you so much. He says, is this France's George Floyd moment? It is, it is. But uh, you have to understand that France is different than America. France has a very revolutionary undertone to political conversation. Revolution is not a taboo in France. It is kind of a taboo. Politically, you go nowhere in America if you are siding with the revolution. Uh, in France, it is an everyday subject of conversation. People will remind themselves of, oh, yeah, you remember when we cut these heads from the aristocrats? Maybe we should do a little more of this, you know? French people constantly talk about killing people and uh, killing the elite. It is something that you'll hear even in high-class context with, uh, with rich French people, with highly cultured or educated French people, whereas in America, you're going to consider this as a taboo expression of low-level violence. Uh, so because of this, uh, there is a revolutionary tradition in France uh, of supporting, of kind of, kind of hypocritically supporting the violence, saying nothing about it, not wanting it to stop. Uh, there's much more support for what we see for anarchy in general than you would have in America. In America, you still have the sense of law and order. In France, law and order is the taboo because the French imaginary. Okay, this is a fascinating perspective here from JF, but uh, Luke Croft is bringing some interesting points in the chat. He says, does a person ever get off their knees once they have accepted the, the way of life of bowing to reality? Yeah, they do. If you have a job, you are effectively a slave to your boss 40 hours a week. All right? Uh, someone who stays married, all right, they do it by keeping their mouth shut when their, their spouse... You know, makes horrible accusations at times where their space, their spouse is just you know out of, out of his mind or out of her mind. Right, the way you maintain friends, the way you maintain life in community, all right, is by 
biting your tongue at times and putting up with someone you know saying things about you that aren't true so yeah you know, having having a job is effectively a form of slavery it's you know humiliating for you know, the, the the great talented soul who believes that you know he's worthy of so much more but it's just simply accepting of reality if you love your children you will change their diapers right you will wade through their feces and their urine and you will clean it up again and again thousands and thousands of times you will go through that humiliation because you love your kids so why would you not go th- be willing to go through humiliation so that you can have the opportunity to wade through rivers of feces and urine and raise your own kids but uh, that means that you must have you know higher priority than feeling like a hero in some delusional stand in you know a wacky and wild world is is obsessed with the idea that collaboration with law and order is the greatest sin. Uh, they have acquired this uh, with, with mimetics around their collaboration with the Nazis in World War II, but it has developed in you don't. You don't stool someone. You don't uh, call the police. You don't complain that you've been the victim of a crime. Those are very much French values right now. So a George Floyd moment in France is very different from a George Floyd moment in America uh, because there is hidden dark support for so every man wants to be a hero, right? Every man wants to take a stand against evil. But uh, how about be, being a hero in the way you conduct your daily life? Like, you want to die for the West, but how about living for the West? You want to die for your country. How about living for your country? You want to die for your people. How about living for your people? You want to die for your family. How about living for your family, right? So instead of, like, going out in a blaze of glory... Why not start creating a glorious life, one action at a time, one word at a time, one habit at a time, one commitment at a time, one relationship at a time, one you know, charitable donation, charitable donation at a time, you know, one uh, act of helping somebody else at a time, you know, getting connected to, to your neighbors, to your community, to your synagogue or your church. So one volunteer opportunity at a time, one book at a time, one essay at a time. How about becoming a hero by building a heroic, upstanding life where you are a good friend to yourself and where from the time you wake up in the morning to the time you go to bed, you feel good about how you've conducted yourself. So more than 90% of the time, from the time I get up in the morning, from 3 a.m. until 9 p.m., I feel pretty good about everything I've done during that time. I haven't eaten too much. I haven't talked too much. I haven't under-exercised. I haven't, you know, overindulged. I haven't, you know, masturbated. I haven't looked at pornography. I feel solid, all right, about every choice that I've made most of the time, right? It's a life that builds together as a symphony. It's a heroic life. So instead of going out in a blaze of glory. Why don't you live for your family, live for your friends, live for your community, live for your people, live for your church, for your synagogue. You know, create an honorable life that is heroic day in and day out. A lot of what you're seeing right now. I'm not saying that the French people are okay with their stuff being broken. But I'm saying the French people fundamentally sees the police as a third party, a third hostile party. They may have some problems with the riots. They're going to say, all right, the rioters have been bugging my life. I hate them but they're going to have much more trouble with the police. And the police, they're like at the lowest level of respect in France. So that's how it works. That's how the cultural thing differs. And that's how uh, it can lead to a much more political friction and much more impact on the society. So here we have a live video. Uh, So there's been riots everywhere, followed by live stream all night. And it is still the night as we speak there. So I've never recorded having been forced to kiss anyone's boot. All right. If you're humiliated, in all likelihood, it's because you've gotten out of touch with reality. You are somewhere you shouldn't be. You have said words you should not have said. You have acted in a way you should not have acted. You are out after midnight in parts of town that you should not be out in after midnight. So in all likelihood, any humiliations that you are going through are the result of your choices. So it's so much easier to blame it on, you know, the blacks, the elites, the Jews, the gays, the the trans, the whatever. In all likelihood, the overwhelming amount of humiliation that you face in your life is because of your choices. Right? It's not the outgroups. It's not the elites. Right? It's not the government. It's not the politicians. It's not the bureaucrats. It's not the media. Right? 
your humiliations overwhelmingly will result because you have gotten out of touch with reality. You have been placed, you have placed yourself in positions you should not be because of your own bad choices. You have said things that you should not have said. Right? You have not accumulated the skills that you needed to accumulate to lead a, a good and honorable and prosperous life. You have not put in the hard work to build a prosperous life. You have not built the relationships with family, with friends, with community, all right, with uh, people in your profession that would enable you to thrive and to, to live a good life. So in all likelihood, the overwhelming majority of humiliations that you have suffered are because of your choices, not because of something that society in the first world has imposed upon you. Uh, police reinforcements heading to Lyon, France. Uh, that was uh, maybe today. Uh, the reinforcements and tanks. So people were noting a very interesting note on this today. You didn't get, you got the coverage of the Prigozhin civil war against Putin. But the Prigozhin civil war against Putin, there's a handful of explosions that have been involved, maybe a couple of shootings here and there. But that is it. And it was covered as a civil war. How is it that if I go on CNN right now, I don't see that France is in a civil war. It's because the, party that, the parties that are at war in France is... Uh, probably the reason you go on CNN, you don't see that uh, France is in a civil war, is because France is not in a civil war. It has a criminal problem. It has a law enforcement problem. It has race riots, but it's not a civil war. Now, I know it's very exciting to say France is being convulsed by a civil war. It makes you sound like an you know, incredibly important commentator who can reveal truths that you know, the establishment is hiding from you. But the reason that uh, normal journalists don't talk about America being in a civil war or France being in a civil war is because they are not in a civil war. They have crime problems. The racial minority of the country, which is very much supported uh, by leftists and by leftist media. And so they won't cover it as a civil war. But I mean, they have basically more explosion, more destruction than you've seen done by Prigozhin or anything like this. And yet they were like, oh my God, Russia is about to fall. If Russia was about to fall because some private general of a mercenary army shot maybe one plane with maybe one member of the Russian army. Uh, what is this? This is a country that's completely fallen. This is a country in ruin. Liberal France gave them a refuge. Uh, people are talking about how there, there is a lot of the Middle Eastern population of France that is uh, participating to these riots. Hundreds of buildings like this have been burnt in France in the last few days. No, France has a law enforcement problem. All right, we think about how much better the United States would have been if it had handled 9-11 as a law enforcement issue, but it didn't. It had to be a clash of civilizations. It had to be Islamo-fascism. It had to be, we have to fight them over there so we don't fight them over here. So all the overheated rhetoric about Islam following 9-11 did us no good, all right? It led us to pointless, stupid, idiotic, self-destructive invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq. We would have been so much better off if we had treated 9-11 as a law enforcement issue, tightened up on the people we allowed into the country, like tightened up on enforcing visas, uh, tightened up on the severity with which we patrolled airports and entrance to the United States. Right? So, so too... I suspect France and the United States and other countries would do well to primarily treat these race riots as matters for law enforcement to deal with. Go tackle them, get the bad guys, put them away for a very long time, and you'll crush our crime rates. All right, what else do we have? Uh, Zimor on the riots. We are in the early stages of a civil war. That's obvious. It's an ethnic war. We can see clearly that it's a race war. We see what forces are involved. We need someone determined and firm. The problem, above all, is the number. Absolutely proper analysis here by Eric Zimor. France has fallen to African migrants and is now an... Uh, Bjorn, I couldn't imagine being a bitter old man ranting to 20 people on YouTube about anti-Semitism. I guess someone has to do it. Uh, what, what channel are you watching? I uh, don't, don't recall anyone uh, ranting about anti-Semitism. Right, uh, so I'm sure there's a target that would be appropriate for your missile. But uh, if anyone has been as open and welcoming of free 
and, and fair criticism of all groups, including Jews, right? Uh, that would be me. I, I can't think anyone who has more extended themselves, more bent over backwards to open up free, open, fair criticism of all sacred cows and all groups compared to what I've done on uh, social media over the past, what, eight years? Islamic Caliphate. When I told you, you know, young people in France can very well be armed with AK-47s or the likes. Uh, hey, we've got Elliot Blatt uh, back. No, Elliot, you said you were backstage and you're gone. Oh, here. There you are. Foolish me. I'm in error. Elliot Blatt, what, what's, what's going on, bro? Oh, blessing, bro. Blessings. blessings. Good points, bro. Really, really crisp, crisp presentation tonight. Enjoying it. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I happened to catch uh, Richard last night, and Richard was basically dunking on the Zoomers, and I, I do sort of agree with him. And the Zoomers uh, seem to have this attitude as though they don't have to pay their dues. They're just sort of entitled to go at the top. And I don't think our generation, being an Xer and all, I don't think we ever had such notions. I, I really think that we kind of understood that uh, you needed to earn your way to the top and, and or even earn your way to the middle. And uh, it was just a basic point. And, and, and these Zoomers, you know, not to criticize them, but they weren't properly educated. I think the first generation that their, uh, their you know, secondary school was probably really infused with Marxism to a degree that ours as Xers wasn't. What do you think? I've never thought deeply about the generations, but for, we all have our blind spots. And I just, I just, my mind just doesn't relate to generations as being a significant category. It, it probably is, it may very well be, but my mind just doesn't work that way. It's, it would be like talking to me about, uh, different flavors of uh, men's cologne or perfume. I, a lot of my friends talk to me about generational differences, and I, I, I just, I'm just blank when it comes to that topic. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I can sort of see your point, but I, I, I don't think it's, it's also... I don't think the idea is without merit either. I think there is something to generations, and... I don't want to say it's necessarily dispositive, but there is something there. And I, I just reflect on my own personal experience with the 30 and under set and how fundamentally disappointing it is. And I think there's something there. I think there's these kids, I think kids that grew up with the internet and the amount of instant gratification that the internet has that they've lived with and come to expect don't have the ability to appreciate bitterness and hard work. And I, I, I think yeah, that's a I real I didn't see any difference I, with our generation. Every, like, what, one of the fact of being a teenager in, in your early 20s is that you have an overestimation of your own abilities and how, how special you are and how the ordinary rules are not going to apply to you and you're not going to be you know, hamstrung and lead, you know, a life like your parents. So I think just part of being young is to have, you know, a sense of drama and a sense of your own specialness. And I, I had it at 18, 22, 25 as well. I, I, th I think you probably did too. I'm sure there are some mm. ways that our generation was superior and there's some ways that our generation was inferior. Like I, I meet plenty of, you know, upstanding, impressive 18, 20, 25 year olds, I, I don't find anything overall inferior about them compared to other generations. Um, I'm not saying that exceptions don't exist, but I think it's a valid observation. I, I, I honestly do. I, I think uh, the, ease, um, the ease with which things are brought to or the ease with which things have been brought to kids post-internet 
has skewed their perception of how difficult the world really is and what it took to bring us to where we are. I think there's, I think there is a lack of appreciation for um, what has been built and what has been given to them. And I, I, I think, I think it's a mistake to sort of discount this criticism. I, I don't discount it. I just don't see it because I, I don't think that we had the qualities, meaning our generation had, had those qualities when we were 18 to 25. Do you, do you really think that we had appropriate respect for the hard work that is necessary to create a good life when we were 18 to 25? Not us necessarily as individuals, but I, as a generation. I don't think we had the option. I think we had to because... I think life was considerably more difficult. I, I honestly do. And I'm not trying to be the guy, you know, the get off my lawn, the old, you know, when I was a kid type of guy here. But it's true that we didn't grow up with cell phones. We didn't grow up with internet. We grew up with, you know, um, you know, landline telephones and three channels on the television. And, uh, just a very limited array of of uh, dopamine opportunities that these kids seem to have been suffused in since birth. Yeah, I, I think that's accurate, but there are many advantages to the way we grew up, and there there are advantages to the opportunities that they have. I, I don't think it's like you know one one way is just inherently. Uh, more productive of, of good people than than the other. Like we benefited from those restrictions of freedom, and we you know, l lacked opportunities that, uh, that this generation has. I mean, how much interaction have you had with Zoomers? And, and what is a Zoomer? Is it people in their twenties? Yeah, to me, a Zoomer is somebody under thirty. Yeah, okay. I mean, I don't know if that's the actual definition, but to me, that's what I'm thinking of. You know, and I've had a very narrow set of uh, interactions with people under 30, but I, you know, I've, uh, well, how do I say this? But like, um, these kids, like, you know, I've, I've now quote unquote employed two quote unquote <laughs> zoomers. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and the terms of conversation are not like, Oh, what can I do for you? It's like, what can you meaning me do for them? Right. There's a total inversion of the sort of traditional uh, employer employee relationship that was thoroughly unthinkable in my days as a 20 year old. Wait, wait, you know? when, when you were 20, uh, were you thinking a great deal at your work about what you can do for your employer? I understand. No, I, I'm saying, yeah, well, I'm thinking, what can I get out of it? But I fundamentally understood that, you know, my value, my paycheck was completely uh, determined by what I could do for my employer. Like, I had no illusions about who stood where in the hierarchy. And today's Zoomers come to you and they believe that they're peers. And they're not peers. They've taken no risk, right? They see themselves as entitled to a certain lifestyle. And it's up to me to provide that for them. Do, do you see what I'm saying? Um, I mean, I hear what you're saying, but I mean, I just know how incredibly selfish and self-centered I am. Like, I Ooh. have not spent my you know career <laughs> as an employee thinking about how I can be of service to my employer. I've thought about how I can get laid uh, when yeah. I'm at work. I thought about how I can, you know, form intense relationships at work so that I can, you know, do the things that I want to do and avoid the unpleasant things. I thought about how I can maximize my income and benefits and, you know, have a harmonious work situation that's, you know, most congenial to me. I have spent very little time thinking about how I can be of service to my employer. And, and in the last seven years that I've been able to raise that from, say, you know, 0.1% to, you know, perhaps 2, 3, 4, 5% of the time has, has made a dramatic difference in the quality of my life. 
but I'm still a 95% selfish person. Um, well, I mean, I think you're basically giving us testimony as to how far divorced from reality you've been. <laughs> well, then, then, uh, how, how inclined, you know, have, have you been to putting your employer's interests first? I mean, you, you must have, I, I, well, you know, to be honest, I, I feel like I've been realistic. I feel like I've recognized the totality of the situation of what it means to both manage a business and work for a business and try to keep a business afloat. Like, uh, I rec no, I honestly recognize the risks other people have been taking and I respect those risks and I respect and appreciate people who have taken risks and therefore I'm willing to make sacrifices. You know, I understand the ecosystem in which I'm able to make a living and I act accordingly. I, I mean, I, I'm trying to remember, is this, you know, the Elliot Blatt who was just so enraged by uh, em employment situations in the past? Oh, I oh. Don't don't get me wrong. Don't don't think that I don't have unpleasant work situations, right? But my unpleasant work situations, I believe, come from people either intentionally or unintentionally being incredibly obtuse and obnoxious. And how much is it a result of your choices and your attitude and your behavior? These unpleasant far less, work situations. Far less than you're implying, bro. Yeah, I'm implying that you're primarily responsible for the quality of your work life. I'm not saying I'm not, but I'm not saying that I'm solely responsible either. No, I'm saying you're effectively 80% plus because if your work life sucks, you should, you know, uh, get something better. Yeah, so should I should abandon my commitments. Oh, so I, you said what commitments do you do you have? Like, is there a reason that you should stay in a hellish situation uh, when there could be a much more pleasant and remunerative uh, situation elsewhere? Yeah, no, I don't think you owe owe it to your employer to stay in a hellish situation if there's a better situation elsewhere. So rather than try to fix a hellish situation, I should just just yeah. throw it all off. Just fuck you, it. Just throw you, it out if, the window, you, bro. Yeah, if you've got a better alternative. I, I think the odds of you changing a hellish situation at work are very small. But if you have what, uh, what from all empirical evidence is a far superior option elsewhere, you should take that. There's no way you should stay in a hellish situation, whether it's uh, relationships or work. Um, you should uh, get something better. Bro, you're giving me the advice of an under-earner, bro. Wait, no, I said something better, something that pays you better and treats you better. Yeah, that's the very I, opposite I know. of underwriting. That's, that's just, no, but you're, 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 you're basically, you're, 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 your attitude is very mercenary. No, right? my if attitude everyone, is very self-respecting. If, self if everyone is as mercenary as you, bro, nothing would get done. Nothing would be built. There's a time for sacrifice. But why and should you, uh, yeah, you should sacrifice for your family. I don't know why you should sacrifice for, for people um, who, you know, are simply employing you when you have far better opportunities elsewhere. I mean, that makes no sense. Like, it's not like Japan, where workers and employers have a deep, often, you know, lifelong commitment to each other. This is the United States of America, where work relationships are overwhelmingly transactional, and employers will get rid of you tomorrow if that's in their self-interest. All true, um, but um, there is no knowledge without sacrifice. There is no great achievement without sacrifice. So if you're, you're, you're basically advancing sort of the sort of careerist, um, uh, what's the word? Um, it's a pyrrhic victory. You're advancing, so you're saying basically if a situation rubs you the wrong way, you should abandon it, right? No, I said if but it's a hellish if situation, if it's hell, if you're in an ongoing hellish situation over months, 
and there is a far superior alternative, you should take it. Obviously, Luke. You're, you're, you're not breaking news here, right? But there's a difference <laughs> so- between hell, you know, there's hell and then there's struggle, right? Like, my struggle, bro. <laughs> <laughs> like, but- what I'm saying is, it's like everyone seems to be rarely accustomed to throwing in the towel as soon as something is even remotely unpleasant. That's all I'm talking about. And like the difference between, right, when I was growing up, there was a certain acknowledgement and respect for grit. You had to have a certain amount of grit and grit was like a necessary component of your character if you're going to, you know, be somebody or be worthy of respect. Okay, so let's talk about ratio of grit and and unpleasantness to to joy. And I, I would say that my ratio when it comes to earning money over the past uh, eight years of, of joy to hell has been something like uh, 10 to 1. Like 10 times as much joy for every uh, bit of hell. Right, but, but, my dear. Would you say, would you agree or disagree that the position you have at your sort of relatively advanced age is really a function of how much grit you brought to bear in your earlier years? Yeah, I, I went through some you know, unpleasant times. I, I did some hard work. So, yeah, but I don't believe that one should go through an awful, you know, hellish experience if there is a super, superior alternative. So... Working out ah. is challenging and hard, and and developing skills is often hard, and doing well at school is often you know unpleasant and hard. But don't make it unnecessarily unpleasant and unnecessarily hard. One has to use you know good judgment. No, I agree there. I agree there uh, absolutely. I mean, you actually you you do have to use discernment, right? Um, but I, I mean, you you've chronicled the the various you know very the the, the various <laughs> trials and tribulations that you've endured to sort of reach this particular plateau that you're on right and when i was growing up it was just sort of understood that you had to do you had to undergo a certain period of hardship if you meant if you were meant to achieve anything and that was sort of a basic assumption and that I, I'm sort of quasi asserting that with the easy access to uh, easy uh, endorphins, um, kids just kind of want the reward immediately and they're not so much down for the grit. And what's your own attitude towards uh, reward versus doing the hard work? I I learned to love the grit, bro. <laughs> and and so how does that? Look? I was I was totally like I was like everybody else, right? I want to do as little as possible, yeah, and get as much for it, yeah, and get yeah. as much as possible, right? And when this when did that theme. change? When did that change? It changed. Um, I don't know, mid thirties. Because I because right. here's why. If you're ever overpaid, right, the problem with being overpaid is the insecurity of knowing you're overpaid. Yeah, and that it'd be in your boss's best interest to replace you or get rid of you. Yeah, you'd rather be underpaid, right, and feel secure knowing that you're delivering more than what you're being paid for than being overpaid and knowing that you're 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 on a tightrope that could easily snap yeah that's that's interesting um because uh there there are a lot of components there like you you may feel or have you know all sorts of evidence that you're being overpaid but if you're still providing you know a valuable function uh well it's not that you're performing it it's all right in my experience i've had periods in my life where I've been overpaid, mm-hmm. but when you're being overpaid, the people overpaying you 
are working double time to figure out how to not have you around. Right. And you, you're, you're in a very, you're in a much more precarious position than you think you were in. Yeah. And so, that. yeah. So, um, the, I, I mean, I'm just trying to, I'm basically trying to echo your message of realism here, mm-hmm. like failing to appreciate the reality of the entire economic situation that you find yourself in will bite you ultimately, even if you do manage to squeak out a few good years of being able to pay. Yeah. So one of the things that I hate is, you know, dealing with idiots. So I've managed to create a life where I have very few interactions with unpleasant people. And so one of the ways that I did that is that I, I charge top dollar for my Alexander Technique lessons. Like I charge more than most other Alexander Technique teachers because I find when I charge top dollar, I get a far better quality of client. And so in, in many areas in my life over the last eight years, I find when I charge you know, more than, than average, I deal with, with better quality clients. Now, landing those higher quality clients takes you know, more work and I have to provide a, a superior quali- you know, quality product. You know, I can't just uh, go through the motions, but it's been really important to me to minimize my interactions with people who I find highly unpleasant. So I've been willing to make the sacrifices, do the hard work to create a life where I have, you know, very few uh, frustrating, painful, infuriating interactions with idiots. Uh, Well, you certainly can't lose in that regard. And that is very funny. There's a meme out there like, you know, like it's it's the people that you give the breaks to. You know, I can't remember the specific meme, but the lower you charge for your services, the more yeah. pl- <laughs> complaints you get. Yes. Right? Yeah. yeah. And it's the higher you charge, yeah. it's like they can't wait to keep coming back. Yeah. I, I, but I, yeah. like how to crack that nut is basically the riddle of, you know, that's what determines the winners and the losers. Yeah, that there's a Frank. I think it's Frank Kern. He's an online marketer, and he found that when he sold products for thirty nine ninety five or sixty nine ninety five, it's just nothing but aggravation. But when he mm. he sold products that only cost three thousand dollars or more, he just virtually had no aggravation. He could run into people who bought his products, you know, at the beach or at the store, and you know they'd just be friendly, nice, nice people. And so too with me. When I started out as a practice Alexander Technique teacher. I mean, I went down to $25 a lesson, and this one student I had, he asked for half lessons for $12.50, and then he would take the time to write a checkout. He wanted to write the checkout for $12.50 at the end of each lesson, and he'd also take phone calls during during our our lessons. Like, just infuriating. It was like, oh, oh. I mean, that, that, that experience, like, no way in hell, not doing that anymore. You know, not giving discounted lessons, you know, just went straight to $100. So our teachers told us, you know, just, just don't charge any more than 75 a lesson. I just went to $100. And, you know, I may have lost out on a lot of students, right? A lot of, uh, you know, other teachers just charge 60 or 50 or 75, probably got more students. But uh, every student I've had that I've charged $100 a lesson for has just been, been a pleasure to work for, work with. Uh, I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it. And um, it, it's a very important point because I've certainly made that mistake. I've way undercharged in the past. And it's it's just brought me in contact with the, with the scum of the earth. <laughs> it's so not worth it. <laughs> and, and insisting that, a, say, a potential employer, you know, live up to their obligations, you know, let, let them know that this is not on, this is not what I signed up for, this is not the deal. Right. Mm-hmm. So developing this sense of self-respect that you automatically develop when you treat yourself with respect, you just automatically start insisting that other people treat you with respect, or if they don't, you walk away. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's also an important point. But conversely, like back to the Zuma question, like there is something about being underqualified, right? There's something about being worthy and 
I think there's a lot of these younger kids that assume that they're much more worthy than they actually are. But didn't everyone our age at 18 have the, the exactly the same attitude? Like to be 18 is uh, to have a vast exaggerated sense of your own capabilities. I, I, I'm not saying I didn't have this. All, I didn't also have this attitude. Yeah. But I got smacked down by reality, bro. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, isn't it kind to get smacked down early rather than just allow someone to sort of uh, drag on this sort of inflate, inflated and detached from reality uh, view of themselves? Well, is, I is think there, that's why is there a place for hard truths. Yeah, th that's why many people retreat, retreat into a world of pornography and video games to try to escape the hard truths of life. Yeah, that's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. Instead um, of having a relationship with a girlfriend, like a girlfriend is going to test you. <laughs> she's going to she's going to push you. She's going to challenge you. She's going to infuriate you. you know, it's so much easier to wank and play video games. Yeah, 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 for and sure. And then justify it by saying, I'm saving myself for marriage. That's what cracks me up. I mean, completely secular people who claim that they're saving themselves for marriage because they don't want the aggravation and the vulnerability that comes with having an intimate relationship with a woman. That's also true, bro. I mean, it's hilarious. Like, giving me the line, I'm saving myself for marriage from someone who's secular. Like, if, if you've got a religious commitment, I, I get it. But if you don't have a religious commitment, uh, then this idea that you're saving yourself for marriage is 99% likely completely fatuous. You're, you're frightened of intimacy and vulnerability that comes with how much you enjoy having sex with this woman and then how much power that you feel like that gives her over you. Also true, bro. Also true. Hey, uh, I, I I drove to Carmel today. Have you ever been to Carmel? Oh, yeah, it's beautiful. Love Carmel. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I didn't even know places like that existed, bro. It's like a white ghetto. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. so nice. I couldn't believe it. Like, I'd always heard about it. This is where Clint, Lee, Clint Eastwood lives, apparently. Uh, yes. Uh, I wanted to move there instantly. I, I I would totally move there, but it's totally out of reach. I'd imagine it's like on par with like Beverly Hills or something. Uh, so nice. Oh yeah, uh, it's, there's so many lovely places in California. I mean, but Carmel, Monterey, Big Sur. Yeah. My God. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's about a two-hour, a little two-hour plus drive. From the city, and uh, oh man, I gotta just move there. Was, so was nice. it was it good for your soul? I mean, did you feel like it a was, different man? Bro. I did, I did. I felt yeah. like there's something to strive for now. It was a little uh, taste, a little taste of something else I needed, bro. I needed needed a new headspace. Uh, but I didn't, I didn't run to Clint sadly. But it was like, it was like you could just feel it, like you walking around and like everyone looked good you know it was just like high iq was like bursting out of every corner it was so you know it was just such a refreshing break bro i i can understand why you like la even though i find la atrocious well you're not even in la you're in like a particular quadrant of la but i mean i love beautiful things i mean <laughs> it's so nice to have the opportunity to, to travel and be around beautiful things because we're different people in different places. Like I'm a different person in Sydney. I'm a different person in Carmel. You're probably a different person in Carmel compared to the, the filth in San Francisco. Yeah. Yeah, I did. I felt like I was, uh, I felt dirty, bro. <laughs> I felt like I was yeah. bringing the stink of San Francisco into, uh, into Carmel. So, <clears throat> Yeah, so anyway, it's good, to, good to travel. Get good to get out of the grind. Like good to do something different. Expose yourself to something different and, and experience yourself as a completely different person. Yeah, but I used to think of San Francisco as being the Carmel, you know. But it's well, not. It was. Bro. It was at it one was. point. Yeah. So it's just amazing how quickly things had taken a nosedive. Like I used to think of San Francisco as like sacred ground, as holy ground. 
and now it's been, you know, despoiled. Well, seasons <sighs> change. Uh, feelings change. It's been so long since I found you, yet it seems like yesterday. Seasons change, people change. I'll sacrifice tomorrow just to have you here on this show today. <laughs> are, you, are, are you trying to taunt me into giving you another Carpenter's quote? <laughs> I just want to fear you by my side. I've got to have your insights right now. It's just been so long sure. since I found you. So anyway, I've been listening to lots of carpenters and like I'm like, how did we lose all this, bro? Like this this, yeah. this is incredible, incredible music. And like wh where do we go wrong, bro? Yeah, I mean, we want to create a life that creates, you know, room and and embodies, you know, Carpenter songs. I mean, it, it's yeah, such like a, only, a sweet, sweet life. Yeah, yeah. Listen to Only Just Begun and just tell me oh, that wasn't like, yeah. like just the most uplifting song ever, ever recorded. Uh, and, and, you know, it was based on they saw an ad for, for a couple moving into a house. It was an ad for... Uh, a, a real estate uh, company, a, a mortgage loan company. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. Did they TV. write it? I, they yeah. weren't usually the writers of some of their top hits, but did they write that particular song? I I believe so. Um, I'd have to do some research, but uh, you yeah. know, I love watching docos on the Carpenters. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, there are a lot of I great mean, doc watched... documentaries. There's even a, a movie, a TV movie that I believe is on YouTube. It's definitely worth watching. Okay, I'll, I'll look it up. I'll look it up. But yeah, uh, just you, you go back and you see like the Ed Sullivan show and all of that stuff. And like, I'm such a like boomer now, but uh, just what joyous, what, what a spirit that existed back then that just doesn't seem to exist now. It's so nice. So it was, it was, it began as a wedding themed TV commercial for Crockett National Bank in California. And yeah. the song played over footage of a young couple getting married. So Richard Carpenter saw the TV commercial and guessed correctly yeah. that Paul Williams was a vocalist. And then yeah. he, he asked whether there was a full length version of the song because the TV commercial only had two verses. And uh, so they, they got together and created a, a full length song, which is just gorgeous. Yeah. Interesting. He was interesting himself. Um, mm -hmm uh he, he as an arranger uh I'm, I'm only only beginning to learn but you know they're from connecticut i was born in connecticut and like you know i can sort of feel the connecticut essence of the carpenters nonetheless even though i only lived there for like less than two years like the first two years of my life but there's something about connecticut like there was just a certain uh style and class about connecticut back in those days it doesn't but, surprise me that yeah. they're from connecticut but imagine how annoying it was for Richard and Karen Carpenter because so many interviewers would ask, why, why are a brother and sister singing love songs to each other? What's really going on here? <laughs> yeah, I know. That is, that is weird. It was shocking. Imagine how awkward learn. that would be. Like every yeah. time you're doing an interview. <laughs> yeah. Asking, well, well, what's, what's the exact nature of your relationship with your sister? Are there any other brother? Well, I guess the Jackson Five were brothers and sisters, right? But are there any other Jack? Uh, any other sibling bands out there? Uh, probably, but it, it is kind of awkward—a brother and sister singing about love songs to each other. Yeah, it it is. It is, and they're not technically to each other, but uh, mm, it's yeah. not weird. But mm. yeah, there's definitely. I, I, yeah, if you want to be cynical, if you want to take a sort of 2023 sort of 4 chan look at the situation, yeah, you could, you could, you could be cynical about the whole thing. But I don't know, bro. You know, this, we've only just begun here, here, bro. We've only, we've only just begun, bro. We've only just begun. All right, man. That's all I got, man. Okay, man. Blessings. All right. All right. Blessings. Show up. Okay. Take right, care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. -bye. Take care. Bye.